with the money to buy the dress, then wear it. And if God made it possible for you to wear red bottom shoes, wear them to church, and when the spirit hits, kick them off, shout all up and down the building. What time is it, church? What kind of preacher do you have? How do you worship him? Well, how do you feel? Well, stand to your feet. Let's turn to Matthew, the 26th chapter. And Deacon Daly read uh, so eloquently. But we're just going to read uh, verses 6 through 13. Amen. Amen. Just verses 6 through 13. Uh, if you have your Bibles open to Matthew, it is the first book in the New Testament. Amen. Amen. And we are going to share the word of God together. Matthew 6. Uh, Matthew 26, 6 through 13. Amen. Amen. When you have it, say, I got it, preacher. I got it. And I'm Bible ready. Let us read together. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much, and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. And verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. Amen. That is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in the presence of God. Let us pray, beloved. Father God, we come right now, first of all, to say thank you. Thank you, Father God, for all of your blessings. Thank you, Father God, because you've been so good. Thank you, Father God, because you've given us an opportunity once again to stand behind this sacred desk and to bring your word to these, your people. Father God, I ask that you would decrease me and increase in me, Father God, so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart is acceptable in your sight. Father God, come into this place and turn it into sacred space. Father God, allow the eyes and the ears to be open to the word. And Father God, we pray that somebody will hear something today that will make them leave this place better than when they came. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. Amen, amen. amen. Now, now, beloved, uh, for the month of February, uh, we will be celebrating Black History Month. Uh, we're going to uh, begin a teaching on how to deal with negative people. Anybody need that? Amen. Amen. I'm going here to tell you today, beloved, that as long as we're in the body of Christ, we're going to have to deal with people who are anti-Christ. And, and beloved, let me tell you this. If you think you're not dealing with folks who are negative and anti-Christ, make sure you come to the altar for altar prayer. You know why? Because that means that the folks in your life who are negative, they're so good at it, you don't even realize it. Those who are negative and anti-Christ, that means that they're negative and anti-us. So, beloved, if you strive to be like Christ and live a righteous life, you're going to face some negativity. And the reason, beloved, is that because growth, when you grow, is often confused with conceit. Yes, it is. See, because once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you grow. And growth means change. And there are those who will never understand that because you have accepted Christ, you don't have the time to do the things that you used to do. 
Uh, you don't have the desire to go to places that you used to go. And that's because, beloved, that a wonderful change has come over you. And see, your elevation has caused separation from folks who are still where you used to be. And because you have a greater understanding of where God brought you from, you don't have any desire to go back. And the problem with that is, beloved, that those who missed your transformation, they catch feelings because now it seems like your behavior has changed. And it's because they're not in Christ that they can't understand that not only has your behavior changed, but your mind has changed. Hallelujah. Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Means you're not going to go to the same places you used to go in. You ain't going to be with the same folk you used to be with. And you ain't going to do the same things that you used to do. Because a wonderful change. And, and what will really upset them is, after they invite you to go where you used to go, so that you can do what you used to do with the people that you used to do it with, they're going to get upset when you say no. So, so they'll try to press you to try to get you to be the old you. But beloved, when you hold on and you yield not to temptation and when their old tricks and their old guilt trips don't work, they'll call you everything but a child of God. But what really will confuse them is when you don't get upset with it. See, see, beloved, negativity is looking for an agreement or a fight. And when you become strong enough to give it neither, when you learn to dismiss the drama, that's when God gives you a peace that passes all understanding. They'll get angry and confused, but you'll be justified by faith. Oh, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. Beloved, for a few moments today, we're going to talk from the thought of the subject or the theme, the answer is Jesus. Uh, I'll look at somebody and just tell them, say, uh, just tell them, say, I don't know what your question is, but the answer is Jesus. I pray somebody received that this morning because you might have you might be going through something you might have been going through something but if you realize no matter what you're going through the answer is Jesus mm. uh, beloved uh, the key moment in our text is it's the anointing of Jesus and the text that we read together, beloved, is, is recorded also in the Gospel of Mark and of John. Now, now there's a different uh, anointing recorded in the Gospel of Luke. It's very similar, but it's not the same anointing. All right. Should it ever come up in Bible study, we'll explain it and let you know how these two occasions are different. We don't have time to get into that right now. But what we need to understand for the moment is that Jesus is in the last week of his ministry. And the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, they're trying to find a way to kill Jesus. And Jesus now has chosen to break bread with a former leper named Simon, whom if you turn back to Matthew 8, you'll see where Jesus healed him. And, and see, uh, here's how we know that he's healed and, and that uh, he's no longer a leper, is that they're sitting and eating with him. You don't eat with lepers. Leviticus uh, uh, very, very clearly states that lepers are unclean. So the fact that Jesus is sitting at meat, and Jesus is not only Jesus, but the disciples and other folk here are at this dinner, uh, we know that he has been cured. So 
it's interesting in the text that uh, it connects the ecclesiastical with the domestic. Now, what that means, beloved, is that uh, it's a spiritual lesson, but it's one that you can apply to your life. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. The first thing I want you to know in the text is in verse 6, even though Simon is healed, he's still referred to as the leper. Let me say that again. Even though Simon is healed, he's still referred to as the leper. See, beloved, the world will label you because of your affliction and continue to identify you by your affliction even after you have overcome or been healed. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me break it down a little bit further. See, negative people will never let go of what you used to be. Because they're more comfortable with your imperfection than they are with your redemption. Beloved, the world is not going to accept you as a new creature. But God. But God and his faithful believers, they'll look beyond your faults and see your needs. And, and sometimes, beloved, we've got to get the understanding that even though folks may call us what we used to be, don't mean that we still what we used to be. See, see we ought to have a praise break right here because, see, my season saints, y'all know just like I know that it doesn't matter what the world sees you as. As long as God counts you among the redeemed of the Lord. See, your redemption can't be revoked, beloved. And, and, and so let me help you. Instead of being hurt by the reference of your past, choose to turn the tables when somebody brings up what you used to be. Use that as a praise moment and embrace the moment and tell them, yes, that's what I used to be. But thank God for his grace and mercy. That label don't apply to me anymore because I am redeemed. And I give God the glory for the things he has done. Tell him when I think about how good God is and where he brought me from, my soul cries hallelujah. And I thank God for saving me. See, beloved negative people, uh, they don't want to embrace your progress. Negative people, they want you to stay where you are. Negative people would rather hinder you than help you. As the old saying goes, misery loves company and negative people love negativity. The text we read together is a great example of how Jesus dealt with negative people. Brother, some, some folk just naturally have a negative disposition. They, they've been so worn out by the world, they expect the worst. They, they find it hard to trust. They, they lost their joy and they walk around insecure and fearful because they've been hurt and still haven't recovered. You know what I'm talking about? I bet you they, I believe that there's somebody in here that knows somebody who's still mad at you for something you did in 1980. <laughs> Somebody said 1940. <laughs> Y'all ain't that old. See, see, the enemy can use them without them even knowing that they're being used. Bible tells us uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and, and, and people in high places. See, you are dealing with the spirit that's in them and not them themselves. There are folks out there who have an attitude and causes them to snap and bite your head off just because you ask them a question. Them, them people have a limited amount of patience and and exhaling is their way of communicating negativity without saying a word. Y'all know what I'm talking about? 
Yeah, well, here's a let me let me for those that didn't say amen. There are folks who have such a a, a, a rough disposition that they will exhale instead of communicate. Here's what I'm talking about. <sighs> and and you know some folks is extra, and some will be like. I, I ain't trying to step on the white toes. I just, you know. Amen. But it seems like for some strange reason, these people always get jobs dealing with the public. You don't believe me? Go to the DMV. But on today, beloved, we're going to learn how to deal with those negative people. Amen. Thank God we don't have none of them in Great Harvest. Yeah. <laughs> I just should have drank the whole thing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise now, verse 7 in the text is where Jesus is anointed. Now, before we can go further, before we can explain, before we can get to this grace part, I got to teach some Bible. Can, that, can I teach Bible? The Bible teaches us there are three types of anointing. There is promotional anointing. And, and promotional anointing is the ordination and the sanctification of leadership. It's usually done in public. You all, you all see it. If you've been to a, an ordination in deacons of, or uh, uh, installation of a pattern, you've seen it. And, and it's for the worldly, what it is, it's for the worldly authorization of godly work. Just like in the Bible, Samuel anointed Saul and then later David for, for, for them to be king of Israel. That is a promotional anointing. Uh, and, and it's a physical anointing and it's done by man. Promotional anointing is the world accepting your promotion. However, it does not mean that you are exempt from error. Being anointed by man also does not mean that God called you. Ouch. Everybody that's been anointed, everybody that's been ordained, everybody that's been installed has not been called by God. God does the calling, but man does the physical anointing. That is the promotional anointing. The second kind of anointing is preparational anointing. Preparational anointing is when you anoint the body in preparation for burial. It's the physical anointing again. It's physical and it's done by man. And in the Bible days, the earthly body would be anointed with oils to prevent it from smelling prior to the burial. And the anointing would occur prior to the dressing of the body with death clothes. And this is what the woman was doing in, in the text uh, to Jesus. She was anointing him with a preparational anointing. She was preparing him for his burial, it says so in the text. But then there's another anointing that, beloved, that's that's the anointing we all can shout about. That is the power anointing. The power anointing is the anointing of power given by the Father and administered by the Holy Spirit. And when you are anointed with power, man doesn't do that. And it's not physical, it's spiritual. Now while the uh, promotion and the preparational anointing is done on the outside, the Holy Spirit anoints you with power on the inside. Uh, let, me, let me prove it with a text. Acts 10 and 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. And he went about doing good works and healing those who were oppressed of the devil. The Bible said, this, this tells us, this scripture tells us that, that 
that Jesus didn't do any miracles until he was anointed with the power of God. And this scripture points to specifically Matthew 3 and 16 where it says that the spirit of God descended upon Jesus like a dove and rested on him. I hope you don't mind I'm teaching Bible right now. Now it was after that that Jesus had the power to do the miracles and the healings that he did. And here's the thing that we all can shout about because it was given to Jesus. That means that we have it too. If you look at Luke 24 and 49, the Bible says, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. That means that every born again believer has power from our Father. Uh, John, 1 John 2 and 20 says, you have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One. Beloved, the Spirit of God is in you. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is not a physical anointing. It's a spiritual anointing that is in you. And you have been anointed by the power of the Spirit. And because of the power inside of you, you have the power to fight against negativity. Beloved, if it can't get in you, it can't hurt you. Look at somebody and just tell them, say, greater is he that's in me. And he that is in the world. See, because of the anointing of power, that means we are all anointed. The anointing lives in us. The anointing has a purpose. And the purpose of the anointing is to overcome this world and the negative people in it. I'll just tell somebody that the anointing is in me. Amen. Now, when we look at the text, verse 6 and 7, uh, Jesus is going to have dinner with Simon, the leper that he has healed. Now, Simon is honoring Jesus with the dinner because of what Jesus has done for him. Uh, keep, stay with me. Because, see, now while Simon is honoring Jesus with dinner, this woman comes in, and in her own way, she begins to honor him too. So she anoints him with this precious oil. The Bible says it's very expensive, Brother Dukes. She pours the oil over his head, and she uses all of the oil to anoint the master. I believe I said it right. She uses most of the oil. Uh, that, that's the thing, beloved. You can't give God most of what you you got to give him all. There's an account of the event in Mark chapter 14, and it tells us that she had to break the alabaster box in order to get the oil to anoint her Savior. See, beloved, here's it. See, we, we, don't see uh, uh, we don't see anything negative in the text until we get to verse 8 and 9, because this is all good. They're honoring Jesus, and, and she has anointed him, and, and, and this is a beautiful thing. We don't see anything negative in the text until we get to verse 8 and verse 9. And in verse 8 and verse 9, there's three things that I want you to notice. The first thing is, the Bible tells us, watch this, the Bible tells us that it was the disciples who got indignant. was the disciples who got indignant. Here's what I can tell you from that. See, when you get your anointing, when you get your promotion, it's going to be some folks that's close to you who are going to be indignant about your progress. Then you got to remember, this is the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. These, these brothers have been walking with him for three years. Now he's being honored, and at the time of his anointing, it's not the worldly folks at the dinner, but the Bible says it's the, the disciples that got indignant. The folks closest to him, the church folk, they the ones that got indignant. Second point is, Negativity came from the folks closest to him, right? But y'all missed this part of it. 
It was the folks who he was going to leave in charge. They got indignant with him. He was going to leave these folks in charge of the church. And they're the ones who got angry about him being honored. The very folk who should have celebrated him being honored, they were the first ones to have a negative reaction to his annoyance. Here's, here's a life lesson. See, when you, when you get promoted, expect folk to be mad. When something good happens in your life, expect the negative people in your circle, and you know who they are, expect them to get angry. You get anointed, they get angry. And when they get angry, they become an adversary. And once the negative people become an adversary, then they have to aggressively articulate and attack. It's in the text. It's in the text. Third point is, see, they attack Jesus with the argument that the oil could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Always follow the money. I told y'all Trump was going to stop that Shut down before the Super Bowl because the people had to get into Atlanta to spend that money. Did you notice one week after it's over that shut down? They can shut it down again. That ain't no coincidence. Follow the money. Here, here, here's watch this, beloved. See, negative people will never see the value in you and will always think that you don't deserve what God blesses you with. That's why they say things like, you can't afford that car. That dress, too expensive. Those red bottom shoes cost too much. Well, they do, but... <laughs> but, but if God blessed you with the resources to get the car, then drive it. If God blessed you with the money to buy the dress, then wear it. And if God made it possible for you to wear red bottom shoes, wear them to church, and when the spirit hits, kick them off, shout all up and down the building. Whatever you can afford to buy for yourself and still tithe. Negative 
people once in a while need to hear you say, God favors me. Every once in a while you need to tell a negative person that that no weapon formed against me shall prosper and it won't work. And every now and then you need to tell a negative person, if you come at me, you better come right. On second thought, don't even come at me. Negative people every once in a while need to understand that because God has been so good, we need to give him praise. We need to give God praise. And here's here's the thing that if you want to be politically correct and if you want to be nice, when you tell a negative person and put them in their place, you can tell them like my grandmother used to tell us when we were kids. Four little letters, just one word. Hush. That's all you got to tell them. You don't have to go in no detail. Hush. Be quiet. I'm here to tell you this morning that because of God... His grace and his mercy and how good he's been to you. We need to all open up our alabaster's box and pour our praise all over this place. So beloved, I, I can tell you that, that, that the answer to the negativity is Jesus. The answer to those folks who are against you is Jesus. The answer to those folks who stab you in the back and talk about you. The answer is Jesus. All you've got to do is get a closer relationship with him. Uh, Did you notice in the text that woman didn't say anything to anybody? She did what she was came there to do. She came to anoint him. She anointed him. She minded her business. And Jesus spoke up on her behalf. The problem is we got too many church folk who will come out of their mouth trying to defend something that God said he was going to defend for you. And when you do that, you mess things up. The answer to negativity is Jesus. He's the almighty. He's the prince of peace. And as long as I've got Jesus, then I've got peace and I've got joy. I've got love. I've got happiness. As long as I've got Jesus, I've got everything I need. I I can tell those with negative energy, uh, you're shut down. I'm shutting you down. I I don't want to hear that drama. I don't want to hear that gossip. I don't want to hear that mess. I'm shutting you down. If you don't have something good to say, the old folks used to say, We need to add that in our repertoire of responses. Amen. Whatever your attack is, the answer is Jesus. I don't care if you don't like me or if you're mad at me. My answer is Jesus. And they'll say, well, I didn't ask you about Jesus. They'll say, well, I'm telling you about him. He's my all in all. I don't know about you. He's he's made a way for me out of no way. And when I was sick, he healed me. And when I was hungry, he fed me. When I was thirsty, he gave me living water. Uh, so negative folk, your energy is canceled here. You can take that. Uh, some of you take your negativity somewhere where they're going to feed into it because I'm shutting you down. Now, the reason why I can say this with conviction the reason why I can say that the answer to negativity, the answer to uh, all of these uh, folk who uh, have this uh, negative disposition, the reason why I can say this is because I had a praying grandma, had a praying mama, and I saw them go through. And one of the things that I, I love when my grandmother, some of you know she lived to be 106, but when she was around about 100, she was still living at home by herself. 
Amen. Amen. And one of the things that I really got a kick out of, I would call her. And I would say, Granny, what you doing? And she'd tell me. And because of her age, she had a lot of friends and they, people would always come by and see her. So the question that I would ask her, I said, Granny, who's there with you? And if somebody was there with her, then she would tell me who it was. But if she was there by herself, and I said, Granny, who's with you? She said, nobody but me and the good Lord. <laughs> See, because my grandmother had the attitude and the understanding that as long as Jesus was with her, as long as she had Jesus, she didn't need nobody else. I'm here to tell you this morning that if you have Jesus in your life, you don't need negative people around you. You don't need that negative energy. You can shut it down because Jesus is the answer to the negative people. Jesus is the answer to all of your problems, all of your situations, all of your circumstances. The answer is Jesus. If you believe it, look at somebody and tell them I've got Jesus. And I don't need nobody else. The answer is Jesus. Now, one last thing to tell you. The best way to shut down negative energy is to never entertain it. Oh yeah, that's praiseworthy. Never entertain it because once you develop and, and, and like they saying, Jesus be a fence. Once you develop that fence around you and folks know that you're not coming for that, you, you're not going for the okie doke, you're not going to allow them to infect you because negativity is an infection. Once it gets in you uh, so you've got to just you've got to start some folk in your life you've got to just start stop entertaining them God may call an ID for a reason <laughs> call an ID is a blessing thank you Lord <laughs> Somebody said, call our knees a shout. <laughs> now, I don't, listen, listen I, I only use my call ID for bill collector. If y'all call me, I'll see your number. I'm going to deal with you. Amen. <laughs> but, but you got to stop entertaining nonsense. Don't, uh, don't give it the time. Don't put that, don't invest that time. Because that's time you could be worshiping. That's time you could be praising. That's time you could be studying. That's time you could be in meditation. That's time you could be giving. That's time you could be in, investing in your ministry. There's so many things you can be doing instead of allowing that negative energy to get in you. And here's one more thing I'm going to tell you. That negativity will stress you out. There are folks all over this world who have lost their mind because of negative energy. Because they entertain what they should have dismissed. And you've got to get your feelers up. You've got to get your antennas up when somebody comes. And if they're not, uh, if they're not bringing energy and positive energy, and if they're not uh, speaking good to you, if they don't have your best interest in mind, shut them down. Shut them down. And you know, it's an easy way to do it because, see, folks that bring that negative energy, all you got to do is tell them, I'm, about, I'm studying the word. I ain't got time right now. <laughs> tell, I'm, tell, I'm, I'm, I'm in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And, and see, see, folks with that negative energy, they ain't reading their Bible. You can make up a scripture. <laughs> I'm in Psalm 217 where the Bible says thou shalt not listen to your nonsense 
thou havest not as the time is. Bye bye. Praise the Lord. Give God a hand clap of praise. The doors of the church are open. That's part one of how to deal with negative people. Amen. Don't entertain their nonsense.